Hello, let's go over the lab for this week on capacitors. Um, I'm going to share my screen and bring up a whiteboard really quickly to just go over some of the concepts. Give it one second to load up. Okay, so a capacitor, what is a capacitor? <laughs> okay, a capacitor kind of sounds like its name. It's a capacity, right? And in particular, a capacitor has a certain capacity to store charge at a given voltage. Um, so that's why we call them capacitors. They're, they're, they have a certain capacity to store charge. And a capacitor is basically any two conductors that are separated by either a vacuum or some other insulating material and one of them has a certain amount of positive charge, the other one has the same amount of negative charge, right? But you've separated them. So if you can imagine, those two c conductors really are experiencing a force, right? Those charges want to move towards each other, but they are held in place, right? So they cannot, you know, move toward each other due to the attractive forces. So there's some energy involved in this to you know kind of keep them keep those charges where they're at right because you know the negative charges really want to move toward the positive and vice versa um so um capacitors store charge like that and there is energy in that kind of thing and so um capacitors are circuit elements that can store energy for you and then you can release that energy through another part of the circuit if you want. Um, so let me just draw a picture. And the most basic type of capacitor that we will discuss in this class is called a parallel plate capacitor. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just two parallel plates, two parallel conducting plates like this. I'm drawing it in 3D. So there are a thin, flat sheet of conducting material metal and the way I would put charge on these two plates right these are two conductors separated by air in between them for example the way I would charge up these two plates of the capacitor would be to connect it to a battery plus side minus side Now what a battery does, <clears throat> without get, getting into a lot of specifics, there's a chemical reaction that takes place in the acid of the battery, right? We know there's battery acid. And that causes a buildup of negative charge on one side and positive charge on the other. And there are, are electrolytes that prevent the negative charges from moving back over to where the positive charges are. So they can't move back this way. So when I connect a battery to a circuit, the only way that the electrons can move is this way, right, through the circuit, because they can't go backwards through the battery. And so if I connect a battery to a capacitor, what's going to happen is that um, there's going to be negative charges on a buildup of negative charge on this side of the capacitor and an equal amount of positive charge left over on this side of the capacitor. And the voltage across the capacitor would be the same as the voltage across the battery. So if this is a nine volt battery, there's nine volts across this capacitor. Um, and so you can imagine once this thing is charged up, there's energy stored in this and I can release this, right? I can allow, you know, I could connect this to another part of the circuit, right? And I could, maybe if I connected it to a light bulb, right? If I, if I 
flip the switch from the battery to the light bulb, right, the electrons can now flow through the light bulb, discharge the capacitor, and light up the light bulb, right, and release the energy that was stored in the capacitor. So it's the most basic idea behind what a capacitor is. And a capacitor, um, as we said, it's, re it's related to how much charge I can store. And, and, that's, and it's also related to um, how much charge I can store at a given voltage, right? So if I connect this thing to a battery of nine volts, right, how much charge will be stored on this capacitor? So <clears throat> it also depends on the voltage that you connect it to. So at a given voltage, right, if I can store more charge on this thing, it has a higher capacitance, right? Or if there's a certain amount of charge on this thing, right, and it's at a really low voltage, right? I didn't have to do, I didn't have to charge this thing up to much of a voltage, right? It's a low voltage and there's, you know, a certain amount of charge at a low voltage. That also means that I have a really big capacitance, right? And capacitance, the units for capacitance is called farads, capital F. That's how we'll denote the units for that. Usually we do not see capacitors with farad level capacitance. It's usually nanofarads, which is times 10 to the negative ninth, or microfarads which is times 10 to the negative sixth farads. So this is the relationship between the capacitance of the capacitor, the charge on it, and the voltage. Right? If, I connect, if I connected this particular capacitor to a different voltage, you would see the charge change and the capacitance would remain the same. Um, so this is just the relationship between these three variables, okay? This doesn't tell me that if I increase the charge on the capacitor, that the capacitance will go up. The capacitance is a fixed thing, right? And it depends on the properties of the materials you're using, how far apart they are, the area of the plates, okay? This is just telling me the relationship. It's kind of like F net, equals ma from physics one right this is a relationship between these three variables does the mass of the object depend on the force that i apply on it no right the mass depends upon the physical properties of the material its density and its size right the same thing goes for this expression right this is a relationship between these variables the capacitance does not depend on the voltage or the or the charge it's a relationship. It tells me if I increase the charge, then the voltage across this thing must also go up to keep the capacitance the same. Okay. Or if I decrease the current, if I decrease the charge on it, the voltage will also go down to keep the capacitance the same. Okay. So this is just a relationship between these variables. Now the question is, what does the capacitance actually depend on? Again, like I said, it depends on the properties of the materials, how far apart they are, the area of the plates, and what's between the plates. Is it just air or is there some other insulator between the plates? Um, for a parallel plate capacitor, I won't derive this for you, but for a parallel plate capacitor, the capacitance depends on epsilon area of the plates divided by distance between the plates. Epsilon is called permittivity. It's basically, it's like a, um, electric, electrical permittivity. It's like, how well does this material allow an electric field to go through it? <laughs> All right. Um, and for vacuum or for air, the permittivity is called epsilon naught, okay, and that would be equal to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. I forget the units right now, but you can look it up in the book, sorry. <laughs> um, 
And epsilon naught is actually related back to our Coulomb constant K. Okay. K, our electric constant from Coulomb's law, is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. So <clears throat> um, this is kind of showing me like how well does this material allow an electric field inside of it because in between the plates there's going to be an electric field right pointing from the positive side of the plate to the negative side of the plate. Um, and so if there's only air or vacuum between the plates the capacitance will be epsilon naught a over d where a is the area of the plate right so it would be the area just of one of the plates and d would be the distance between the plates um so if i make the plates bigger they're going to be able to store more charge right that makes sense and they're good that's going to increase the capacity right um on the other hand if i decrease the distance between the plates, the capacity will also go up. If I, if I take these plates farther apart and I increase the distance between them, the capacitance goes down. Um, so that's the idea. Um, if you do insert uh, another material in between the plates, you will learn that that material has what's called a dielo dielectric constant k and it's not the same as this k i'm sorry <laughs> this is lowercase k this is capital k dielectric constant we've run out of letters and greek symbols at this point so <laughs> we're just repeating stuff now but k is also is called the dielectric constant for that particular material and if there is some other insulating material in between the plates besides air or vacuum, the capacitance would be equal to the dielectric constant K times epsilon naught A over D. Okay. So in this lab, you're going to investigate all of these ideas. You're going to look at how changing the charge, the voltage affects the capacitance. You will look at how changing the area, the distance, or inserting a dielectric, or which is basically an insulating material, how that affects the capacitance. So let me bring up the lab. And the beginning of this lab, again, goes over some of the concepts that we talked about. Here's the capacitance of the capacitor and its relationship to charge and voltage across the plates of the capacitor. And as we mentioned, there is energy stored in this capacitor, right? Because it would take energy to keep these plates apart, right? They want to fly together because one of them's positive, one of them's negative. They, they're attracted to each other, right? So it takes energy stored, potential energy to keep these things separated. <laughs> um, so the, these expressions are all expressions you could use to determine the potential energy stored on the capacitor. I won't derive them. Um, just know that it depends upon the capacitance, the charge, and the voltage across the plates. And lastly, the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor depends upon the electric constant, the area, of each plate and the distance between the plates. So in the first part, you're going to verify that the capacitance depends upon the geometry of the parallel plate capacitor. So if we go, so we're going to go into the simulation and what we're going to do is change the plate area and change the plate separation and see how that affects the capacitance. In the first part, you're going to keep the distance between the plates constant, and the only thing you're going to change is the area. And you're going to record the area and the capacitance and see how that, see how those things are related. And in the second part, you're going to keep the area of the plate constant and change D and look at how that affects the capacitance. So let me 
bring up the simulation so I can kind of show you how to work work the simulation. Okay, so here's the lab. Click here. I usually just click the browser compatible version. It takes a minute to load up. Okay. <clears throat> so in the first part, what you want to do is just click on, you want to look at how the capacitance is affected by the separation. So let's bring up a meter that shows us what the capacitance is. And the lab says in the first part, we're going to keep the distance between the plates constant at 10 times 10 to the negative third meters. And we're going to change the area of the plates. So let's keep um, the separation 10 uh, millimeters, right? And the area of the plate is 100 millimeters squared, and the capacitance is 0 0.89 times 10 to the negative 13 farads. You would record those two in the table. And then you can check a couple other values. Let's increase the plate area. Let's go up to like a little bit over 200, 202.3 millimeters squared. The capacitance has gone up, and that's as we would expect, right? Because we know the capacitance would increase if the plate area goes up. So you would record those two values, and then check one more, 400 millimeters squared. Again, the capacitance has gone up. It's directly proportional, and it's, it's like linear, right? So that the area goes up, capacitance goes up. All right, let's go back to um, plate area of 100 millimeters squared. And in the next part, you're going to be decreasing the plate separation. So let's look at how decreasing the plate separation affects the capacitance. That In that case, you would be filling out this table right here. We're going to keep the area constant and change the distance between the plates. And you'll fill out this table. So let's go back to the simulation and do that. And let's make sure that our prediction matches what the simulation is showing. So we learned that as the plate separation D decreases, the capacitance will go up. So let's see if that occurs. That's what we observe. As I decrease the plate separation, the capacitance went up. Okay. There's nothing to graph here for this one. I just want you to conceptually understand that the capacitance of the capacitor depends upon the geometry here. Okay. <clears throat> In part two, you're going to look at the relationship between capacitance, voltage, and charge. You're going to keep capacitance constant and change the voltage across the capacitor. We're going to set the value of the capacitor to be 0 0.89 times 10 to the negative 13th farads. And we're going to change the voltage of the power supply and record the charge. So let's go back to the simulation. OK, so capacitance is, as it starts off, it's 0 0.89 times 10 to the negative 13. If you need to just reset everything to the original, just click Reset All. <clears throat> 
Now we have a battery connected here, but we, we, we need to increase the voltage here. So let's increase the voltage of this battery. And we, we, we wanna know how much charge is on this. Okay, so let's click on the meter for plate charge. There is 0 0.63 times 10 to the negative 13th coulombs of charge. All right, Pause, that's, po that's po on the positive plate. The negative plate would have negative 0 0.63 times 10 to the negative 13th coulombs. So, and let's also determine the voltage here. The voltage across the plates of the capacitor is the voltage of the battery as well, right? So if I bring my voltmeter out and I just put both of these probes on either end of the capacitors, capacitor, I can read off the voltage. So at 0 0.714 volts, the plates have a charge of 0 0.63 times 10 to the negative 13. So let me record that in the table. And I will do, sorry, two more uh, data points. Let's increase the voltage a little bit more. 1.161 volts, the plate charge is now 1.03 times 10 to the negative 13th. So I will record those two data points in my table. And I'll just do one more. I'll crank it all the way up to 1.5 volts. At 1.5 volts, the plate charge is 1.33 times 10 to the negative 13th coulombs. So I will put that here. 1.5 volts, 1.33 times 10 to the negative 13th coulombs. When I write capital E, I just mean times 10 to the, and then negative 13, okay? Now for this one, you are asked to make a little graph, okay? And you want to plot um, Q on the y-axis and V on the x-axis. And determine the value of the slope and how, what is, and determine what does the slope represent, right? So let me go into Excel and we'll just review how to make a graph in Excel one more time. So I'm gonna write voltage here, charge here. I'm gonna fill in all of the voltage values I had. And when you're typing scientific notation into Excel, you can just write um, the value and then capital E and then the and then the um, exponent. Now let's insert. We're going to. I think you will have a couple more data points here. I only. I'm only going to do three right now. Um, Okay, so this is charge, and you want it to have charge on the y-axis and voltage 
on the x-axis and that looks like what is being plotted here you've got charge on the y-axis voltage on the x-axis so that's good Um, ch change this title to charge versus voltage. It's always Y versus X. So charge versus voltage. Okay. And then we're going to put our line of best fit through this and determine the slope of that. So um, I'm going to click on I'm going to click on the data like if you just click on the data right here like the points it will bring up an option to draw a trend line so click that on it should be linear you can set the intercept to zero because if I have zero voltage on it I'm going to have zero charge on it right so that makes sense and I want the equation All right, so the equation is y equals 9 times 10 to the negative 14th x. So the question is, what does that mean, right? Before, we learned that the, capac the relationship between capacitance, voltage, and charge was capacitance equals Q divided by voltage. If I rearrange this just a little bit, this is Q equals CV. Okay, I just brought the V, I just multiplied both sides by V, right? Um, and this is now in the format of Y, right? Y equals MX plus B. But B here again is zero, right? If the, the intercept should be zero. If I have zero voltage on my plates, I should have zero charge on my plates. So B is just zero and I'm going to delete it. So charge corresponds to the y-axis, voltage corresponds to the x-axis, the only thing left is capacitance, that should correspond to the slope. Okay. And the slope here is 9 times 10 to the negative 14th. Does that match what our capacitance was? If I go back to the simulation... Our capacitance was 0 0.89 times 10 to the negative 13th. That's almost, that's basically 9 times 10 to the negative 14th. I just moved a decimal place over, right? Um, so that is making sense with the data that we have right here, okay? The lab also asks you to calculate the percent error. And in case you have forgotten how to calculate percent error, it's always the absolute value okay so percent error it's basically how far off are you from the accepted value so you take the absolute value of your um, experimental which is what we the data that we collected in the experiment minus the actual value which would be 0 0.89 times 10 to the negative 13 farads. And then you divide it by the actual value again. The experimental is like kind of what you calculate it to be using the data, and the actual value is what it actually is, right? Um, and then you just mul and then you just take this and you multiply it by 100 to get a percentage. So it's, it's basically like how far is your experimental value off from your actual value? Like what percentage is it off? Okay. Um, so that's how you're going to do that part of the lab. And then the last two parts are going to help you learn about how energy um, is affected by 
the capacitance and voltage. <clears throat> so um, you're going to keep the capacitance constant and you're in, going to increase the voltage on the capacitor and record the charge, the stored energy, and the electric field. Okay, so let's go back to the simulation and see how we can do that. So I'm going to keep the capacitance the, the same, right? So I'm not going to change the area of the plates or the plate separation. I do want to record the plate charge, so I'll keep that here. I also want to record stored energy, so I'm going to click on this meter for stored energy here. They used to have an electric field detector here, and they removed this option. I don't know why. Um, but you can click the electric field lines just to get a general idea of how the electric field changes as we increase the voltage. So I'm going to keep capacitance the same, and I'm going to gradually increase the voltage here. So I increase this a little bit. The plate charge goes up, as we would expect, and here's the stored energy. So you will record this in your table. And here's our electric field lines. They always point from the positive to the negatives, and they're pointing pretty much straight down here. As I increase the voltage a little bit more, you will record these new data in your table, the voltage goes up, charge goes up, stored energy goes up, and also notice the electric field between the plates goes up, right? There's more electric field lines there. If I crank it all the way up, plate charge increases, stored energy increases, electric field also increases between the plates. You don't have to record the actual value for the electric field since they took the detector away, just notice that it actually increases. <clears throat> so if I could then take this capacitor and, you know, connect it to a different part of my circuit, this is stored energy that I could use to do something else in the circuit, right? So that's the idea. I can store this energy and use it later. Usually elect uh, capacitors are great for like a big burst of energy, right? So you maybe need a really bright camera flash, right? That takes a really quick burst of energy. Those are usually the kinds of um, applications for capacitors and stored energy. Okay, and the last part of the lab helps us think about what happens if I insert a dielectric, which means the only, that, that just means what happens if I insert an insulator between the two plates of the capacitor. And in real life, most capacitors have some kind of insulator in between them. Because what they do with real capacitors in real life, if you actually look at one inside of a circuit, they take this, these two plates, they, and then they sandwich an insulator in between them, and then they roll it up, almost like a little, like, jelly roll or something. And so cap uh, capacitors kind of look like little cylindrical things inside your circuit because they're basically just rolled up parallel plate capacitors. And so what the insulator does is, is it keeps the plates separated. It prevents the plates from touching. You don't want the plates to touch, okay, because that's just going to discharge your circuit, right? You want them to remain separated. So there's a practical value for inserting an insulator between the plates. But you will also learn that when you insert a dielectric, um, it actually increases the capacitance as well. Okay, so let's see. So what you're going to do is you're going to switch over to the dielectric tab in the lab. You're going to um, set the plate area between 195 to 205 and plate separation between 7.5 and 8.5 and increase the battery voltage to um, 1.5 volts and you're going to insert dielectrics and you're going to observe how the capacitance changes, the stored energy changes, the plate charge changes, the electric field and the voltage across the plates change. Okay. 
So let's do that in the simulation and observe what happens. So you will click on the dielectric tab here. Let's make this plate separation a little bit bigger. Put this a little bit smaller. It actually doesn't really matter. This is fine. Okay. And we're going to crank this up to 1.5 volts. Again, they took out the electric field detector, so you won't be able to actually measure the electric field, but you can just look at how it changes when I put this capacitor, uh, when I put this dielectric in. So we're going to start off with a dielectric constant of um, 2. Okay. If it was 1, that's not going to change anything, right? Let's increase it to 2. And we're going to measure plate charge, stored energy, capacitance, and we can also measure the voltage across the plates. Our original capacitance, you, re you can record that in your table, the original plate charge, the original stored energy. Now let's observe what happens when I insert the dielectric of dielectric constant 2. Mm -hmm. Notice that the, let's observe again, the plate charge increases, the energy also increases. But the voltage does not change. It remains 1.5 volts. And the amount of electric field lines here are, is the same. So physically what's happening is that inside this little dielectric, it's an insulator, and the insulator can become polarized. It, the electrons cannot flow freely inside the insulator, but they can become a little bit separated as you see in the simulation. I'll take away the electric field line. See how these little um, things become separated in the insulator, right? The electron spends a little bit more time over here and the proton ends up, there ends up being an overall positive charge on one side of the insulator and negative charge on the other side of the insulator. And it creates its own little electric field inside there. And so to offset that and to maintain this constant voltage, right, across this capacitor, there has to be more charge stored on the plates. So notice as I insert this, more charges build up on the plates to maintain the constant 1.5 volts. Because when I insert this, there's an opposing electric field in the, in the insulator. Um, but to maintain that electric field inside, more charge builds up. So what does that tell me? At a given voltage of 1.5 volts, increasing, inserting a dielectric increases the amount of charge I can store on it and increases the capacitance. So a dielectric is actually a good thing. It actually increases the capacitance. It increases how much charge I can store at a given voltage. Okay. So you will record these values in your table and then you can insert a different dielectric constant. You can pump it up to like three. You can store even more charge and more energy as you um, increase your dielectric material. And if you're interested, you can also try different materials, Teflon, paper, or glass as well. And see how that affects the capacitance and record those data in your table. Um, so that's the idea behind this lab. There's, there's only one graph uh, needed, which is the graph of um, charge and voltage. The other ones, I just want you to record the data and kind of conceptually understand what happens when I change different parameters or insert a, di a dielectric. And then there are some conceptual questions at the end. So I hope that makes a little bit more sense to you. Um, 
please contact me if you have any questions about this lab and I will see you in the next lab. Bye.